Assalamu alaikum. I hope so you are all doing fine. I am Dr. Muhammad Ali Rabani, Assistant Professor of Anatomy. And today we are going to discuss the lesions of pons. This is lecture is a part of the lectures on brainstem that is a part of a larger series on neuroanatomy that we are conducting on medical academics. All the lectures are freely available on our YouTube channel. Please click on the link of the playlist and you will have an access to the lectures. We have till now discussed the general anatomy of nervous system, the spinal cord in detail and the lectures that are present also are of all the other areas including the cerebral circulation and hypothalamus and so on. So let us discuss the lesions of pons. If you have not, I would suggest you going through the lecture of the anatomy of the brainstem, especially the internal structure of the pons, the cross-sectional anatomy of the pons. So now let us start with that. So this is what we finally built in our last lecture on the cross anatomy of pons in the cross section anatomy. There was basal part of pons, the tegmentum and all the tracts and various nuclei that were present in them. I am not going into the detail right now. If you feel like it, please uh, follow the link to the normal anatomy of pons lecture. So for our lecture, we will start with medial Pondine syndrome. I always suggest that you focus on the areas that are affected. Try to memorize that image and figure out each of those structures that are within that affected area. Let me discuss with you with example. Medial Pondine syndrome occurs due to this basilar artery blockage, especially the paramedian branches. So these are the branches that are getting from either side of the basilar artery supplying the pons near the midline. So when that is affected, this is roughly the area that is affected near the midline. So one by one, pick up the structures that are affected and then we will discuss what happens with that. First, where my pointer is, corticospinal tract. What function is lost? The function, divert function is done by the corticospinal tract. It is the upper motor neuron that controls the contralateral sided muscles. So the loss of it, it will lead to upper motor neuron type paralysis or spastic paralysis of the contralateral body. Hemiplegia, contralateral spastic hemiplegia. Why contralateral? Because at the level of pons, we are much above the decussation of the corticospinal tract as the tract will go down and cross the midline to the opposite side at the junction of medulla and spinal cord. So there is contralateral spastic hemiparalysis or paralysis means weakness. Then the prominent feature is due to this medial lemniscus. <coughs> medial lemniscus is carrying the two point discrimination, proprioception, vibration sensations and it is carrying the signals from the opposite sided body. As the signal started from the one side, it went up in fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus, synapse in nucleus gracilis and cuneatus, crossed the midline just above pyramidal decussation, and then it went up as medial lemniscus. So the involvement of medial lemniscus will lead to contralateral loss of tactile texture, to point discrimination, position, vibration, and proprioception senses. Then there is this fibers. These are these fibers. These are the fibers of the cranial nerve number 6. Even when the nucleus is not damaged, the exiting fibers they get involved. These are intraaxial fibers meaning the part of the nerve tract that is present within the central nervous system here within the bones. This is the nerve that is the 6th cranial nerve, abducer nerve. Abducer nerve supplies the abductor muscle of the I that is the abducer ab lateral rectus muscle. So the nerve will not cross the midline and supply the lateral rectus of the same side. The person will lose the ability to abduct the affected eye. There will be lateral rectus paralysis on the ipsilateral size and ability to abduct the eye. Okay. When a person is consciously trying to abduct the eye will not move it will stay here and the normal eye will move 
and even when the person is looking forward when the person is trying to look forward normally medial rectus and lateral rectus they both exert some muscle tone and the eye is adjusted somewhere in the middle in the absence of lateral rectus the medial rectus tone will dominate and medial rectus tone will dominate and pull the eye medially so that will be medial strabismus oh, i think i have mentioned lateral strabismus here so that will be medial strabismus so that's about it you try to think of the major items corticospinal tract leading to contralateral spastic hemiparalysis medial meniscus leading to loss of two point discrimination and vibration contralaterally of the body lateral rectus paralysis leading to paralysis of lateral gaze of the affected side and medial strabismus and there is additional mentioned the lateral gaze paralysis very near to the pontine nucleus i have not discussed in the anatomy part there is another nucleus that is present somewhere here that is parapontine reticular formation that is responsible for moving both eyes to the ipsilateral side so if my pointer is at the right pontine nucleus the parapontine reticular formation is responsible for moving both the right and left eye to the right side so overall the lateral gaze is paralyzed rather than only the later lactus muscle on the same side and when this base of the part of the pons is x this affected then these horizontally running fibers the transverse pontine fibers making up the middle cerebral peduncle these will be affected and that will lead to the cerebellar features that is the ipsilateral lip and gate ataxia next later pontine syndrome in the later pontine syndrome the artery that is usually involved are one of the two anterior inferior cerebellar artery or superior cerebellar arteries so these are the two arteries anterior inferior cerebellar arteries and superior cerebellar arteries as the name indicates the inferior one this is affecting the pons at the lower aspect the caudal aspect and the superior cerebral artery one the occlusion of this will affect the higher up pons the rostral pons <clears throat> so the lateral aspect will be affected these are the areas will be affected we will be discussing this facial nerve these spinal laminiscus spinal nucleus of trigeminal vestibular cochlear inferior peduncle and right now not shown in this picture just above it there is trigeminal nuclei we will discuss those also <coughs> what happens with the inclusion of the interaxial fibers of the facial nerve sometimes the nucleus is involved also otherwise facial nerve is involved and in any case the the function of the facial nerve is lost the nerve is damaged then this will lead to the ipsilateral lower motor neuron type paralysis of lower half of the face of the complete face my apologies there will be ipsilateral flesh paralysis of the complete face there will be absence of wrinkling absence of blinking nasolabial fold will go and inability to close the mouth properly on the affected side and healthy side of the mouth healthy side of the face will pull all the structures towards itself similarly other functions include the taste fibers from anterior to third of the tongue that sensation will be lost and the facial nucleus the facial nerve is responsible for parasympathetic output to ganglion through pterygopalatine ganglion there is a secretion of lacrimal gland the tears the secretion of nasal and secretion of palatine mucosa all of these will dry up there will be no drops uh, no tears leading to drying of eye drying of nose drying of mouth in addition to that through the second secretion that is superior salivary nucleus that supplies the submandibular gland and sublingual gland through submandibular ganglion so those are also on function non functional that will lead to the further drying of the mouth moreover stapedius muscle in the ear is responsible for dampening the sound so hyperacusis is there so these are all the functions that are lost corneal reflex is lost because of the motor limb the blinking component the muscular component is lost 
middle cerebral peduncle already discussed with the medial syndrome too. So these are responsible for taking the transverse fibers, the cerebellar and the cerebellar features will be evident here. And these are ipsilateral limb ataxia and gait abnormality. Then there is vestibular nuclei shown in purple here. These are receiving fiber from vestibular apparatus from the inner ear and they carry the signals of balance and movement and position. So when these are affected, when they are not functioning normally, you will feel a loss of balance. When the, such balance issues are there, the person feel dizziness, vertigo is there and that leads to the person developing nausea and vomiting also. So these are all the issues that are created due to the vestibular nucleus and then there is nystagmus and this is a point where the eyes of a static person just move pendularly on one side to another. There is gradually drift to one side then adjust it, gradually drift to one side then adjust. So the person has nystagmus that is due to the vestibular ocular reflex loss of function but that is not currently our topic so I am not discussing that in detail. Moving on with further there is spinal nucleus of and spinal tract as we have discussed in medulla oblongata and even in the lecture of cross-sectional anatomy of bones the spinal trigeminal nucleus it carries the pain and temperature signals from the ipsilateral side of the face so these are affected these are lost spinal thalamic tract shown here in this picture this one this one spinal thalamic tract it is a continuation of anterior and later spinal thalamic tract from the spinal cord they were carrying the pain temperature to point pain, temperature, crude touch and pressure sensations from contralateral body. Why contralateral body? Because that track has already crossed the midline at the point where it entered the spinal cord in the anterior gray commission. So there will be contralateral pain and temperature body will be lost. Cochlear nuclei, they are present anterior and posterior to the inferior cerebellar peduncle when they are involved. Epsilateral hearing will be lost as the fibers that are coming from the spiral ganglion, they relay here. So when they are affected, hearing is affected. Descending hypothalamic fiber, descending autonomic fiber, descending sympathetic fiber, they are traveling down from various autonomic areas of the higher centers, especially hypothalamus, and they are traveling along with the spinothalamic tract, and as they move down, they are going to supply the presynaptic sympathetic neurons. So when they are affected, the presynaptic sympathetic neuron do not give any output. So there will be Horner syndrome. They do not cross midline. So there will be ipsilateral Horner syndrome, ipsilateral loss of sympathetic output. And that will lead to the ptosis, drooping of eyelid, meiosis, pinpoint pupil, constricted pupil, and anhydrosis, that is the absence of sweat on that face on that side. Of course, there are other features also, but they are very visible. They are very prominent. So, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis. That is scan. Especially when talking about the upper part of the pons, especially in the issue of superior cerebellar artery, trigeminal nuclei, the main motor and main sensory nuclei are affected. Due to the effect of main motor nucleus, the muscles of mastications, those become weak or paralyzed, lower motor neuron type and other muscles, two muscles that are present here that include these muscles that are present here that is the anterior belly of digastric and myelohyoid and two muscles with the name tensor in them, tensor villi palatini, tensor tympani that will lead to the weakness of chewing, weakness of mastication and if you ask the person to protrude the jaw forward if you ask the person to put the jaw forward, the jaw will deviate towards the paralyzed side. If the person, rather than protruding the jaw forward in the midline, it deviates towards the right. Then there is a paralysis of this right-sided lateral pterygoid muscle. So, deviates towards the same side. All the other sensations will also be lost because the main and fibers of the trigeminal will be included, so all of the functions will be lost. So, ipsilateral anesthesia of the face will be present. 
and very prominent among them will be corneal reflex i am highlighting corneal reflex again with both because that is the reflex that the loss of it that leads to wasting of the eye in the facial nerve paralysis the blinking is not there the lacrimal gland is not batting it and at the same time the sensation is not the person does not know that it per its i need help its i need blinking or fluid or anything like that and it will eventually dry out and get permanent damage so that was about the lateral pontine syndrome locked in syndrome pseudocoma it's a very scary disease when you think about that here superior pons or base of the superior pons is affected and when the base is affected you can see bilateral corticospinal tracts are damaged bilateral corticobulbar tracts are damaged along with these nuclei facial and uh, abducens so it is usually is due to demyelinating disease but vascular accidents may also lead to this happening but when that does happen the corticospinal tract is bilaterally damaged so there will be bilateral loss of all the motor function there will be bilateral spastic paralysis quadriplegia all the four limbs will be non functional corticobulbar tract bilateral loss of the cranial nerves that are below this level that under the all the cranial nerves at the pons and the at the pons and the below medullary level and that will lead to a person totally incapable of moving the person totally paralyzed and even the person is completely awake due to the sparing of all the sensory tracts here the person is able to feel everything and that's why i'm saying it's scary due to the presence of the person is awake can think wants to communicate feels everything but cannot because everything is paralyzed so that is the locked in syndrome usually some features are available like if some part of facial nerve is okay then blinking may be there or if that's affected the upper new muscles like oculomotor and trochlea they may be present that may lead to some movement of the eye the functions of the oculomotor and trochlea muscles and through those little movements those person those through movements the person tries to communicate there are computers that do it now but in a simpler version you can ask the person to blink the eye for a yes or blink twice for a no and anything you can think of. so that's the locked in syndrome pseudocoma so that's from my side uh, from the pons lesions thank you so much for listening if you have any suggestions questions feedback please let us know on our website on our social media handles our e email and phone numbers are present here and don't forget to follow us thank you so much see you in the next lectures